on the yes, <laughs> I need a I need a pillow as well, but <clears throat> okay. Jennifer Jansen, Communications Director for Airlines of Europe. Welcome to our fourth annual Aviation Summit Press Conference. We will begin uh, with Thomas uh, Reynard, our Managing Director, who will uh, yeah, present the latest on A4E, our A4E members, uh, followed by Ben Smith, CEO of Air France KLM Group, and our 2020-2021 Chair of A4E. Followed by Willie Walsh, CEO of IAG, Kasten Spohr, CEO of Lift Transit Group, Johan Lindgren, CEO of EasyJet, and of course Michael O'Leary, a 4 uh, outgoing chair and CEO of Ryanair. So without further ado, Thomas, please get us started. Thank you very much, Jennifer. For the clicker. Good morning to you all at our fourth uh, A3 Aviation Summit. Uh, we're just waiting for the slide to go on. Um, Thomas Reinhardt, Managing Director of A4E since 2016. I helped to start up this wonderful organization. And um, we're doing very well, as you can see on, on this slide. Uh, we've never been as representative of the European commercial airlines as before. Uh, we've actually, we're actually very happy to have welcomed uh, TUI uh, since December last year, and the TUI has been uh, part of our steering board and our AGM this morning for the first time. So, a great welcome to TUI. It's a great addition to have TUI to uh, A4E. That makes us uh, not only the largest European Airlines Association, but also the most representative. And with that, I, uh, I pass on to our new chair of A4E, Ben Smith, the ch uh, chair and CEO of Air France KLM. sector, 
but we have good experience from SARS at maintaining flexibility and close collaboration among airlines, airports, and governments is essential in managing the outbreak and its aftermath. In this extraordinary situation, it's important to explore all available options in order to reduce the impact on airlines and passengers. Such discussions should take place at both national and European levels. More specifically, we strongly request from the EU that a temporary waiver be granted by all member states for the use of the 80-20 slots rule. This would allow us to allocate our resources in a more flexible manner in these unusual challenging times. We welcome the European Commission's recent decision to earmark 232 million euros in aid to boost global preparedness, prevention, and containment of the virus. Meanwhile, we will continue to liaise with the relevant authorities and keep our passengers up to date on any important developments. So that's the official statement on the coronavirus. So we'll, we'll start now with uh, a few slides that uh, no. all of us are going to, uh, going to uh, point out to here. So I'm the first one here to discussing uh, our role, our key role in the Green Deal solution here in Europe. So climate change is one of the fundamental challenges of our time. Uh, in line with the Paris Agreement, the aviation industry stands united in our efforts to reduce our climate impact. So we support Europe's Green Deal, Europe's Green Deal goals, and want to actively contribute to their success. This is a very, very large challenge for a growing sector like ours. But to date, significant progress has been made, but zero or low carbon technological solutions um, today are not readily available. Meaningful ATM reform, sustainable aviation fuels, research and development in new engine technologies and smart economic measures are all necessary tools to help our sector rise to the challenges set today in the, uh, in the current Green Deal. A for E airlines are confident, however, that we will meet this challenge head on. All EU policy measures need to be aligned in order to meet the Green Deal goals and major public and private investments and prioritization is uh, definitely needed. So taxpayers' money must be focused on initiatives that will make a difference. States have an equal uh, responsibility uh, as, well as, uh, as well as airlines. So delays in improving the efficiency of Europe's air traffic management system is unacceptable. Quicker and widespread deployment of future technology is, is definitely required. So EU airlines are in strong competition with third country carriers, so carriers outside of Europe. More effort is needed to strengthen Europe's climate diplomacy to ensure our businesses can remain competitive, fully competitive. So just to hand it on now to the second slide, which uh, Willie will walk us through. Thank you, Ben, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think as everybody in this room knows, uh, Addressing climate change requires considerable action. As airlines, we believe we're playing our part, and in fact, you can expect us to do even more going forward. But we need other areas of the industry to do more, particularly in relation to air traffic management. The, the slide in front of you shows the fragmented nature of European airspace. It's divided geographically and in fact, as you will probably know, in many cases, governments in the countries divide their airspace up even further. So this is very fragmented and very inefficient. Uh, it's outdated. It's causing us to fly considerably longer routes than is necessary. Uh, you may have heard me say this before, but 40 years ago, 40 years ago, I was flying a 737-200, flying around European airspace and it's shocking to know that, you know, that aircraft, which had very basic avionics and navigation equipment compared to the aircraft we have today, but the, the flight paths that we were following 40 years ago are exactly the same as they are today. Uh, and when you look at the avionics and navigation equipment that we have on modern aircraft, uh, I recently had the opportunity to fly an A350. You know, it's staggering to see the advances that we have made as an industry in terms of the equipment on board the aircraft. Collectively, as airlines, we have invested billions in new technology. 
but we're still being forced to fly through the sky in the same way as we were 40 years ago when we had the most basic navigation equipment. And quite honestly, that, that is a scandal. Uh, if you look at, if we move on to the next slide, if you look at the way we're operating today, it's estimated that uh, if you look at 2018, where uh, airlines within Europe, within European airspace, emitted about 67 million tonnes of CO2, it's estimated that we could save, with the modernisation of air traffic, we could save about 7 million tonnes. And if you extrapolate that and include all airlines flying through European airspace, it's estimated that we could save about 25 million tonnes of CO2 if we had a more efficient air traffic system in Europe. So the single European sky has been debated for, I don't know, 30, maybe even 40 years. Uh, it's probably been debated since before I was born. Uh, and it's time to stop the debate. We, we need action. This is quite honestly a scandal. And we're calling on the Croatian and German governments in their leadership in the Council to address this issue and start making real progress in relation to the single European sky. You know, we will play our part. We will do what is required from us. We will continue to invest billions to ensure that we have the most modern equipment capable of flying through European airspace in the most efficient way. But we require ANSPs in Europe to play their part, and we require governments to start taking action rather than talking about this so that we can significantly reduce the amount of CO2 that's being emitted in European skies. Thank you. Yeah, Willie, thanks, and good morning also from my side. On top of the single European sky, which is an almost obvious major tool, as Willie Walsh explained to safeguard environmental improvements. Another topic is synthetic and sustainable aviation fuels, which I'd like to spend a few words on. We believe that this is probably the most realistic and surely the most effective means to really seriously reduce CO2 emissions of aviation in the next decades. And I would go as far as saying that this could have a decisive input on climate protection by the magnitude of the issue. Uh, sustainable aviation fuels have the potential to probably reduce CO2 emissions mid and long term by 85 to 90 percent. So I think that's huge and very important. They can be used on today's aircraft. And when we talk about today's aircraft, one element which is sometimes forgotten when any of us order aircraft now, they'll be delivered whatever in the next two or three, five years, they'll be flown for 25 years. So 30 years from now, will be operating aircraft which already have been decided to be ordered and produced. So it's elementary that next to other you know, interesting issues, electric propulsion and so on, it's about the current fleet in the world to reduce CO2 emissions. Already the governments allow 50% of sustainable aviation fuels to be used on board of the current aircraft. Even that, I think, could probably be brought up. If, and now we come to the big if, that fuel was available. And uh, the fuel available currently is way, way too small. The volumes, to give you an idea, if just my company, Lufthansa Group, would have access to all synthetic fuel available in the world, it would just last 36 hours to keep our fleet in the air. So we have a major issue here about availability, and there's a major issue about cost. This fuel costs about four to five times as much as current fossil fuels. So in a highly competitive industry like ours, first of all, none of us can afford that extra cost. And secondly, I think it's always important to maintain a level playing field around the world. So the regulators cannot push us into blended fuels unless they do that around the world, because otherwise you decrease competitiveness of, for example, European airlines who have to follow those regulations and others in the world would not which would even incentivize passengers to take detours with a higher impact on the environment because European airlines are disadvantaged. In our case, we offer our customers to buy sustainable fuels if they wish to do so, and we then every few weeks go to San Francisco and buy big volumes of sustainable fuel to compensate for that, but also the truth is that the number of passengers doing this is quite limited. So I think in a future scenario, we need to do both. We need to bring the cost of synthetic fuels significantly down 
and the need to bring the availability up. And we believe this is a huge opportunity for EU policymakers to play a leading role in the future of decarbonizing our sector. And therefore, it's Airlines for Europe calling on the European Commission to make sustainable fuel a policy and a priority in their policy. We believe it's time to develop a European industrial policy for sustainable aviation fuel production and national policies, which is quite a few, should support that, incentivize research and development to make sure number of billions of liters required are eventually available. Also, we believe it's um, time for the policymakers to cre create a European plan to develop production plans, not necessarily all in Europe, but wherever they say sustainable electrical energy is available, which is what you need for at least e-fuels, which we probably think is the biggest topic to be scaled. And we need to create so-called financing circles where, for example, money taken from aviation taxes could be used to support the use of blended sustainable aviation fuels being more expensive, compensated by those aviation taxes invested into this, and therefore having a real impact on the environment by aviation taxes rather than the money going somewhere else. And all of that, of course, I need to repeat, without further impacting the competitiveness of European airlines, where already we are disadvantaged today, participating in the emission trading scheme, which, for example, is forcing us to have higher costs for our feeding flights into the European hubs, where if you feed a hub outside of Europe, you can avoid the emission trading. So I think that's something to keep in mind. But again, I'll come to that in the end once more. We believe this is huge, 85 to 90 percent less CO2 per passenger. It's very worth to focus on, and we hope the European Commission puts that into their list of priorities. Thank you. Johan. Thank you, Carsten, and good morning, everyone. Um, well, uh, first of all, let's just also say that uh, one of the things we wanted to discuss here today was also then not only to reiterate the messages on, on SAS, on sustainable aviation fuels, but I think it's also important to highlight that there are other technologies as well that are actually you know, have the opportunity to become true zero when it comes to the emissions, not only on carbon, but also the other greenhouse gases. And I'm talking about electrification and then also hydrogen, which should be mentioned in, in that context. The, the one thing to note on this is the, that the development of these technologies are absolutely staggering. If you go back only a couple of years, two, three, four, five years ago, none of the things that you're seeing today when it comes to the battery technology would be something that a lot of people would have thought just some years ago. Because this development is not linear, it's absolutely exponential. And one of the great things about this technology is that if you compare it to, to a SAF, as an example, which is actually a form of offsetting, because you are producing you know, carbon emissions as you burn it, but the difference is, of course, that when you then are growing the biomass, you're absorbing the, the carbon from there. So it's a main way of looking at this from an offset point of view. So what we like to do now is put additional focus and highlight really what the electrification and hydrogen can do. You know, I, I've been spending a lot of time on this, and like I said, only a couple of years ago, there were, you know, people who said, well, it will never happen. Well, you know, today there are more than 200 projects that are looking at airframes of the size of 150 to 200 seat air aircraft uh, capacity that will fly on hybrid electric by a time frame that's going to come within a decade. I think Airbus is looking in the mid-2030s on hybrid, and there are a number of other companies as well. We're working with Wright Electric at EasyJet, who's looking for this to be introduced as a model from 29 and 30. Now, whether this is going to be 29 or 30 or 31 or 32, you can now see a roadmap on how to get there, which is in a true zero uh, um, uh, way in terms of the, 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 the non-emissions of both carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases as well. It doesn't come without challenges. There's definitely a lot of challenges in here, both in terms of the infrastructure at airports, both in terms of actually what will it mean for the different airlines' business model 
in terms of, of, of how we would operate with quick turnarounds and so on. But there's no doubt that when it comes to the short haul flying up to 2,000 kilometers, that these technologies will be absolutely game changing. And one of the things that is in them important to do is to make policymakers and decision makers, for instance, when it talks about taxation, to incentivize the industry to decarbonize in this way. And today, the taxation that we have, you know, I think is quite absurd in many places. If EasyJet, as an example, or anyone for us that matter, if we flew today at a true zero carbon emission, we would pay the same taxation, apart from the ETS, as we did yesterday. It's absolutely surreal. There needs to be ways where we as an industry can also get a regulation around taxation which incentivizes us to move in this direction. Apart from the discussion that I think ongoing is around in some governments that we, we are looking at demand side proposition. Uh, let's curb the demand which is completely the wrong way to go. We need to look at way on how we decarbonize what we do and let continue to have millions and millions of people to enjoy the benefits and the privilege that, that flying has given. So that's what we're calling out for, you know, that we are looking at more of these technologies that will become available and then also that there are funds available to get us in an industry in a place where, where we can look at true decarbonization, uh, decarbonization of the industry. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Johan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So again, today you'll hear us frequently call for the completion of the single aviation market in Europe. 25 years after the creation of the single aviation market, you know, air, uh, our life and the life of consumers across Europe has been transformed. We have many more, uh, much more connectivity, thousands of jobs have been created. And consumers around Europe now not just enjoy, but ex expect to travel all the way across the continent at lower fares. And all of the airlines, whether it's the low-cost carriers or the legacy responding to that competition, are delivering extraordinary value to our consumers in the form of lower fares. You look at the trends in recent years in train fares, almost any other competitive, competing form of transport, a, a real air, underlying airfares are falling. But we could do so much more if just the single aviation market was completed. Uh, we'll be releasing details of a study today which we commissioned uh, by the University of Bergamo uh, which uh, calculates that the cost to the EU economy of the incomplete uh, single aviation market is uh, more than 35, uh, 34 million billion, 37 billion euros per year. Almost half of that is caused by the, the lack of, uh, of reform uh, of, the, of the single European sky in air traffic control delays, flight delays, uh, related fuel burn, uh, and the very significant and severe environmental penalty that Europe suffers as a result of these aircraft being delayed, stacking overhead airports, burning unnecessary fuel, because of these delays that would be removed, as Willie has said, if we simply had or the completion of the single, avia, the single European sky. 50% uh, of this, that equates to about 20, 25 euros per passenger traveling across Europe. These are huge gains that are available to be made. And again, we continue to call for action, particularly from the European Commission, on implementing uh, the single European sky. We would also like to see the, uh, the single aviation market remove the rights of national governments to use aviation as a tax grab or a tax gatherer uh, against consumers. In the last year, again, another 16.7 billion of unilateral aviation taxes are being scammed from both the airlines and our customers uh, under the guise of environmental taxes. We're paying EU ETS. In the UK, we pay APD. In Germany, equivalent of APD. The Austrians in the early next year uh, are going to quadruple uh, the, uh, the, the, the aviation tax on short haul flying. None of this money would be spent on the environment. It's simply a tax grab. Uh, it's a latter day, uh, it's the uh, equivalent of a latter day highwayman. And we need the Commission to work with us to push back. We've got to complete the single aviation market. We need a single European sky. We don't need another year, 20 years of talking about delivering the single European sky. And delivery of this would transform not just the lives of our passengers, our lives as consumers, but it would be one of the greatest economic gener or generators of economic activity across the European Union uh, for the next 10, 20 years. And I'm now handing over to whom? Ben, soon the last slide. Is it? 
Thanks very much, Michael. Um, passenger rights legislation. Um, I'm sure that will be of interest to you as well. A recent study done by consultancy Steer actually revealed that the cost of compliance for airlines under the EU passenger rights compensation, the famous EU 261, has increased by more than 13% every year since 2011. According to the same study, in 2018, EU 261 costs amounted to 5.3 billion euros, or basically 4.4 euros per passenger. These costs represented 90%, 90% of airlines' average yield, keeping in mind that 2017, 2018 um, were business expansion years for the EU airlines. And such a growth trend will now slow in 2020 and onwards as fuel costs increase. It's therefore an enormous need for immediate action to reform this legislation EU 261. We've said it before, but it's become very clear now th uh, thanks to the latest data. Make sure that we make the rules clearer, fairer and easier to apply, both for the airlines and the passengers, to be honest. We are encouraged, though, by the Croatian's presidency initiative, the recent initiative, to reach a first agreement in the Council on the revised Air Passenger Rights Framework, EU 261, by June of this year. It's a very positive um, dynamic. With this effort, the Croatians are working on, passengers will benefit from a number of key improvements, including, first of all, the right to better care and assistance in all cases of disruptions. Secondly, improved information on the passengers' rights and clearer rules for obtaining compensation. Thirdly, at the same time, there will be less inconvenience for the passenger as airlines will remain incentivized under the current proposal to bring passengers to their final destination as quickly as possible in cases of delay. So we are very grateful for the current momentum that we're seeing now on the Croatian uh, EU Council presidency that runs until the end of June of this year, and we expect EU leaders to proceed swiftly with this important update. Thank you very much, and I think with that, we, Jennifer, we open it up to the floor for Q&A. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks to all our CEOs for their statements. Uh, we'll start with the Q&A. Uh, we will be taking a limited number of questions on coronavirus, so uh, we'll start right here. Javier. <coughs> Javier Espinosa, Financial Times. Can you just be more specific about the sort of actions that you will be taking in light of this crisis? And, and secondly, is this a 9-11 sort of moment you think that we're living is in comparison to how bad it is for the industry on the coronavirus? Okay, thank you, Javier. Who would like to take that from the CEOs, perhaps? Uh, Willie? Yeah, maybe I could start uh, because uh, at IAG we um, made formal announcement last Friday. Uh, so what we had seen in Asia was a significant reduction in demand. Uh, I think um, people here would be familiar with the decisions that were taken by uh, pretty much all airlines flying into and out of China where uh, you know, flights were either suspended or cancelled. Um, what we had noticed at an IAG level was that the demand had stabilized over the past few weeks. Uh, but then Monday of last week, uh, with the um, announcements in Italy, uh, we noticed a very significant fall off in demand uh, in the Italian market, um, principally in the north of Italy, mainly Milan, uh, but impacting on all Italian airports. Uh, I think this is a fast-moving, dynamic uh, situation, so it's far too early to say uh, what this uh, will mean, uh, but I think all airlines flying into Italy have responded by reductions or amendments to the uh, schedules, and I, I would expect that to continue. Certainly in our case, uh, we had taken a decision to reduce our schedules into and out of Italy uh, to the end of March. Um, we will monitor the situation and see how uh, the market uh, responds to developments. I, I don't see this as being similar to 9-11. 9-11 um, was clearly a transatlantic issue. 
Um, it represented uh, a very significant fall in demand on the transatlantic, uh, but it did recover pretty quickly once US uh, uh, skies reopened and uh, customers were able to understand the, uh, the nature of the uh, situation there. We saw a pretty quick response uh, from a customer point of view. I think the situation uh, with the coronavirus is much more dynamic uh, so it will require, uh, certainly from an IAG point of view, it will require um, a period of time for us to assess what the underlying demand is like. But if it follows the pattern that we saw in Asia, um, we would expect it to stabilize in a couple of weeks. Uh, clearly the demand into and out of Asia has stabilized at a lower level, uh, but it, it, it is stable, pretty much stable at this stage. The other thing uh, we commented on last Friday was we had seen uh, a fall in uh, demand from the uh, business sales channel. So this is not just in the premium cabins, but in both premium and non-premium as a result of uh, companies introducing more restrictive travel policies and also the cancellation of uh, large events uh, that would normally be attended by corporates. Uh, so, um, you know, as an industry, we've seen these issues before. Uh, we've responded. Uh, positively, uh, I have absolutely no doubt that the industry will uh, respond and take all necessary measures uh, to address the uh, changes in demand in the short term and uh, I have equally no doubt that we will see uh, traffic uh, recover in due course in the way we have seen it recover in uh, previous events. Next question here in the front. I thought it was somebody else. Go ahead. Uh, Kathy from Aviation International News. Um, does the situation with the coronavirus um, warrant some kind of state aid to weaker airlines or to all airlines? And secondly, have you had contacts um, as Airlines for Europe with the European Commission on to see if this is false under extraordinary circumstances of uh, 261, please? Thank you. You want me to take the question? You know, want me to? Yeah. Thomas. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, on the last point, uh, yes, I mean, there are a number of possibilities here where government could certainly uh, support. Um, with regard to extraordinary circumstances, EU 261, um, uh, I think Commissioner Valéan yesterday was quite clear at the Commission's uh, press conference that uh, this, the coronavirus situation, um, it does uh, um, is an extraordinary circumstance, and that that will be taken into account is is yes does qualify an extraordinary circumstance. But of course, you know uh, the state of the regulation. Uh, there could be still questions, and it's quite doubtful. This again, I think, a good example why we need a very rapid and very clear uh, uh, review of the current regulation. So, the commissioner and and most people clearly recognise as extraordinary circumstance and. Um, I think that's, that's a good proof. Um, on the other measures, um, the, the 2080 slots um, um, regulation um, is what uh, Ben mentioned uh, earlier uh, on, on the panel. Um, uh, we know that uh, IATA has uh, asked, and I believe there was a release yesterday, uh, for um, a temporary waiver, and uh, A4E also supports that. Um, it is not unusual. Uh, to have a temporary waiver in these situations. Uh, we've seen it on the SARS and some other circumstances. So yes, to conclude, we are actively working with the European Commission, but also with national governments, since they also, of course, have a say in this, um, to, uh, to ask for some temporary waivers. Thanks. Okay. In the front, please state your name and where you're from. Yes. Sorry. Uh, no. It warrants state I'll, aid. I'll, I'll give a personal view. I don't believe it does. Um, you know, I think there are airlines who were looking for state aid before this happened. Um, I don't think this is an excuse for these weak airlines to uh, demand further state aid from their uh, governments. Uh, so uh, I think the industry will respond in the way the industry always has. And uh, I, I don't believe it's um, appropriate that uh, governments start look to provide financial support to uh, airlines who were not sustainable before the outbreak of this cor uh, coronavirus. Okay. And 
And I'll just add uh, something specific to France. There are new uh, unique taxes that are being introduced in our sector, the aviation sector. So something that we will be looking uh, to ask for is a delay uh, in introduction of some of the unique aviation taxes that are about to be implemented. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the front, please. Uh, Richard Skrum on Air Insight Airline Award. Could you quantify each of you how much capacity you out uh, and how many aircraft have you grounded since uh, yesterday and what is the expectation for the rest of the month? Well, that's really changing on a daily basis. So it's, in our case, we made announcements Friday to have grounded 23 white bodies out of 200 and 25% of up to 25% on short range according to the situation. Uh, in Italy, we have put more than a third of the capacity on the ground in the last days. But this is a very dynamic situation, and I think all of us with the crisis management experience we have as an industry are adjusting our schedules on a daily basis. Anyone else? Okay. Etika? Okay. Etika de Jong, Daily Telegraph, the Netherlands. Uh, I have a question concerning... Um, what Europe, the European, European Commission should do. Um, someone mentioned they should act, uh, they should do this, they should do that. Um, why do you put your hope in politics instead of yourselves? Well, with respect, um, I think we are taking action already. Um, you know, I think the industry has responded very fast to the situation. If you go back to the outbreak of the coronavirus in China, I think within a very short period... On sustainability. Oh, I apologize. On, on sustainability, well, I think we are all taking action. Um, you know, I, I personally believe we've got a great track record. Uh, if, if, if I speak from an IAG point of view, what we've seen in the last five years, uh, we've seen a, an increase, 53% increase in the number of passengers we fly. That's on a 34% increase in capacity. So you can see we're getting more efficient. Uh, so there's a disconnect, and people don't fully understand this, a disconnect between the amount of capacity we have and the number of passengers we're flying. And that's based on a 21% increase in CO2. So a 53% increase in the number of passengers we're carrying uh, with a 20, just over 21% increase in CO2. So you can see how efficient we are becoming and all the measures we're taking. And you've heard in the presentations, you know, the investments we're making in sustainable aviation fuels. And as Karsten said, it's important that, uh, you know, others support us in relation to that. In relation to air traffic control, it is a scandal, let's be honest. It is a scandal that we're still flying through the skies today in the same way as we were 40 years ago, uh, given the change in technology on the aircraft. You know, the aircraft we're operating today are capable of flying from point A to point B, uh, they don't require land-based navigation. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea that uh, air traffic control is still operating the way it did in the 70s and 80s, when we have invested billions in technology to enable us to fly in a more efficient way. And we're not allowed to fly our aircraft in the most efficient way because we're still operating in an environment that was established years and years ago. So we have the right to call on the Commission and governments to do more because it's being held up not by us but by them. And as I said, if, if we could see a more efficient air traffic control system in Europe, uh, it's estimated that we could reduce CO2 that's being produced within uh, European skies by over 10%. That's a massive saving in CO2. And it's not from the want of trying or the, the, the want of action on our part, it's because we're not seeing other areas respond. And air traffic control, ANSPs and governments need to address that and they need to stop talking about doing it and they need to start action in relation to doing it. So we're playing our part and we will continue to play our part, but I think we have the right to call on governments to do their... Okay, please state your name and where you're from. Sorry, can I just uh, add, a, add a thing on that as well? I mean, one thing is just reiterate what Willie said as well. But you're looking at taxation. You're looking at a country where you come from, in Holland that's an example, where I, I lost track. I lost track of the number of sustainability taxes tax that they goes on, on to, to, to this system. EasyJet in itself pays 650 million euros of taxes apart from what we're paying into the ETS. 
and they've been labeled sustainability taxes, green taxes, and as far as I can tell, none of them goes in to do anything what we're really here to do, which is really to decarbonize what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at then the design of these taxes, the flat passenger taxes that does nothing in terms of stimulating and incentivizing you know, efficient flying, I don't think that ha that holds up to any scrutiny anymore. It just simply doesn't. We need to see a taxation system. We're not afraid of taxes. We're paying a lot of taxes. But what we want to do is to make sure that those taxes are also <coughs> linked into how efficient we're operating. As I mentioned earlier, it should be linked in to us being incentivized to decarbonize what we're doing, not to get people to fly less. And, I, and I, once again, I lost track of the number of meetings I've had with politicians across Europe sitting in rooms. And we kind of, everybody sits and agree around the principles around the table, but nothing happens. It needs to be called out. Okay, we'll uh, take a couple more questions. Yeah, Ian Taylor from uh, Travel Weekly in, in London. Um, the Global Business Travel Association polled 400-odd four, uh, corporate travel managers last week, and uh, two-thirds of, of them were reported cancelling trips, meetings, events, and so on. But two-thirds of them also said they expected the restrictions on travel to last for more than three months, six months, or, or, or they couldn't say. So I wonder, Willie, when you, you said that you would, you hope you might see a stabilization of the situation within a couple of weeks, as you saw in Asia, but in, at a lower level, are you saying that you would expect to see a, a, a reduced demand at a lower level for some weeks or months to come once things become uh, clearer? And secondly, are any of you seeing any general reduction in leisure demand thus far, not just to Northern Italy or, and so on, but a more general reluctance to commit to a booking. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, if I could take that. Um, are we seeing much of a reduction in leisure demand? Yes, but it's very short term and close in. I mean, I think, you know, if you want my personal view of this, I think we are going to have a very deflated booking environment probably for the next two or three weeks. And then people will get bored with the coronavirus and the coverage of the coronavirus. Actually, one of the upsides of the spread of rapid spread of the coronavirus is there's much more education among both passengers and uh, our citizens generally. Hand washing is a pretty effective way of dealing with this thing. Oh, yeah, this um, the next key, uh, if you like, event is Easter, which is mid-April. Now, I think uh, clearly we're all, uh, we have a lot of kind of forward bookings already in the system for the Easter period. Will families who have already booked Easter holidays travel? I think the, at this point in time, unless it gets much worse, we see no diminution or demand for cancellations or for lack of travel around the Easter period, but it could get worse. And thereafter, May could be a little bit soft, but I think by the time we get to June, July, or August, as long as things have settled down, then I think you will see a pretty rapid return to normal travel patterns, aided and abetted by what would be an outbreak of seed sales across the industry once we see kind of demand returning to normal or the, um, the, the panic levels reducing. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Social media is a scourge for idiots. Um, but, you know, common sense usually wins out in a reasonably short period of time. So I, my view is it will be soft for the next couple of weeks. It will settle down over Easter as long as there isn't any um, great inflammation in the situation across Europe. And if it settles down over Easter, then people will begin <coughs> to rapidly focus on summer travel. May might be a little bit soft, but I mean, we see, we've see we taken a big hit in short-term bookings, nothing around Easter, and bookings through the summer period are reasonably robust at the moment. Okay, we're going to take three more questions, non-corona related. Andrew? <laughs> Andrew Charlton from the Aviation Intelligence Reporter, a non-corona related question. Um, Willie, you talked about the reform of ATM. You know it's a topic I love. Um, and you keep calling on the Commission, but it's not the Commission, is it? It's the national governments. So my question is actually to, to Ben and to Carsten. Why aren't you doing more to make your states, which are frankly, let's be honest, let's name names the worst offending, in Europe, why aren't you doing more to make ATM, to reform ATM? Mike, I can take it. Well, believe it or not, every visit in Berlin I do right now focuses on single European sky. Of course, there's also an update because Germany will take over the presidency. But I fully agree with you, we need more pressure 
on the air traffic management providers. And why I'm a little bit more positive than the last 20 years. So far, the arguments have been passenger convenience and money, and that didn't get us anywhere. Now, there's a new argument in town, environmental impact. And we all know the power of that argument on many other parts of our globalized civilization. So I do believe it's much more difficult for politicians and responsible people and the air traffic service providers to evade the argument of CO2 than they have been for 20 years running away from the arguments of passenger convenience and money. So I fully agree with you. It's not all here in Brussels, but the German government promised to us that they will make this a priority when they take over the presidency. And since Germany itself is one of the countries which causes the problems. I fully agree with that. I do have somewhat more hope than in the past that there is now more attention on it. But of course, all of you are asked for help as well. Huh? This needs to be in the public every day to embarrass those who don't take the necessary steps. And in our case, I use the example that of our white body fleet, 10 747s are doing nothing else every day than fly to New York and back without any passengers on board, burning holes into the air just because of the inefficiency of the single European sky. And that's something I think politicians and people who manage national air traffic service providers cannot just live with. Ben? I'll just add one, uh, one other point to, what Car to Carson's points here. Uh, you know, now with all these additional taxes that are being assigned uh, or being uh, imposed uh, in the name of sustainability, this is another uh, reason or another argument that we have uh, to push for single uh, European uh, skies. Uh, there is money now to, uh, to help us out, money that wasn't there in the past. One or two last questions. Saeem? Again, um, non-coronavirus related? Yeah. Okay. Um, Saim Said from Politico. Um, on sustainability, you guys aren't really united, though. Um, you have some people that are really into offsetting, others are not. You don't have a collective target. Some are more efficient than others. And uh, no, I'll take that one. two airlines on, to, on that stage have a carbon neutrality target, others don't. I'm wondering how useful is it for you guys to, to come together to talk about sustainability when you have very different models, very different outputs in terms of absolute emissions, very different efficiency measures, and it's actually something that Ryanair, for example, has used to go after others in terms of how it is more efficient and cleaner than the others, with varying degrees of truth to that. But anyway, okay. the question being, how do you actually work on this when uh, you don't have committed I'll targets. Make the point uh, about the roadmap. I'll make the point about targets. the roadmap and then you, you can jump in. Uh, Thomas? Yeah, Saim, thanks. I'll just, uh, and then Kasim, feel free to, to jump in. Um, as A3, we, we took the decision um, last year, mid of last year, to, because this is a, a, a global challenge if we talk about CO2 reductions. Um, but I'm also being global from, from an industry perspective. So we've, uh, A3 has actually taken the lead, as, as you know. Uh, to start work on the European um, sustainability roadmap uh, for aviation, together with all the partners. The airports are very supportive, the, the OEMs, uh, the air navigation service providers, believe it or not, and the European Regional Airlines Association. So we think it's, it is, would be very powerful, and this is why we're putting a lot of time and effort and investment into it in, in our European roadmap as a joint effort, it's similar to what's, uh, what the UK, uh, the industry in the UK has been doing, so we've taken that as a model. Um, the final results of uh, the study we are actually, we have commissioned, uh, are expected in May, so stay tuned, you can expect more results there. So I think um, it, 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 you know, it's much more powerful to, to get together as a group, including the airlines, but also the other suppliers, because we're all in the same boat. We all need to work together. So and I think that will be a very powerful message as we get it out um, end of May. Michael, do you want to say something else? Or? No, just one. All of us sitting here once a year doesn't mean we're not competing. And you know that. We're competing fiercely every day. And I think the CO2 issue is another issue we compete on, on best ideas. And there's nothing wrong with it because it makes us all better. Oh, Michael has the highest load factors, EasyJet has mandatory compensation, we offer sustainable fuels for those who are willing to pay for it, Willie was early giving a target, um, Air France is investing into new aircraft and has a 
So I think there's very many ideas how to get to the best CO2 impact or the reduced CO2 impact. And some of it, though, cannot be done by us, but has to be done by the regulatory bodies. And that's why we are joining forces and voices. Mm -hmm. But besides Should that, we're all competing for the same customers. We try to again, convince that we, them that we all to, of us, we need to come out with a target airline, so, not on this yeah. stage, well, are doing their best on uh, CO2. And that's part of the competition environment, which makes us all better and the environment mm -hmm. less polluted. So there's nothing wrong with that, I think. We're over time, so... Okay, I think we're out of time. Is yeah. there maybe one, one last question from the back of the room? Okay. So we can get him you a mic. Get your break in between. Well, who's that? <laughs> Hi, Lawrence Frost from Reuters. Um, well. Hearing a slightly more nuanced message on tax today, perhaps, is it fair to say that, um, that, that with the emphasis on circular financing and so on, that you're now more uh, amenable to the idea of new environmental taxes providing that the, rec the receipts are ring fenced for sustainable fuel investments, is that fair? And otherwise, uh, a slightly related question, um, should there be a sort of a pause or a truce on these measures in the light of the coronavirus challenges you're now facing? First of all, I, I don't think anybody thinks it's a good idea to introduce new taxes. What we think is that there should be a redesign of what taxes are out there because they do nothing in terms of decarbonizing the industry. that doesn't incentivize anything on that. So this is not about reintroducing you know, any taxes that is, that is there, but basically fundamentally shift the way on how we as an industry are in, in incentivized to decarbonize what we're doing. Sorry. I, I, if we've conveyed some impression that we think taxation on air travel or national taxation on air travel is okay, then I want to uh, completely ta uh, remove any misconceptions. I mean, give you an example of what we're dealing with at the moment, why we're pushing for a single aviation market. The Austrians, the new green government, have decided that from the 1st of January next year, they're going to reduce uh, the, uh, the long-haul aviation tax, which is the most environmentally um, polluting form of air travel because of seat densities. They're going to reduce that and they're going to quad quadruple uh, the environmental tax on the look, on the short haul uh, travel in Europe. I mean, there's no environmental basis for that kind of a taxation move. It's just a tax grab. They have much more traffic traveling short haul, so they quadruple that. And they'd have fewer passengers traveling long haul, so they'd be seen to reduce that. So you reward the most polluting uh, form of air travel and you penalize the most efficient or least polluting. So it's just one example. You know, the taxation, uh, this taxation is the wrong way to go. We as an industry are investing huge sums of money in more efficient aircraft, better at engine technology, electronic, uh, electric battery propulsion. Um, and those measures need to be sustained and supported as well as the development of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Taxation has done nothing for uh, Europe's passengers for the last 25 years. The UK raises, I don't know what the number is in uh, APD, billions each year in APD, and not one pound has ever been spent on the environment. We have sent three or four separate questions to the Treasury in the UK asking to identify even one environmental project that APD has been spent on. They can't identify one. I think we need to... Yeah, just to reinforce what Michael said, uh, so IAG paid 967 million euros in air passenger duty in the UK last year. You know, just one, and not a single cent of that money went to environmental research, environmental support. And, you know, the idea that we add more taxes is just damaging to the industry because it's reducing our ability to invest in new technology and our ability to invest in sustainable biofuels, uh, our ability to invest in research and development. So, you know, that air passenger duty, as everybody knows, was introduced as a, uh, as a uh, environmental tax. Um, 967 million for one airline group in the UK and not a single cent went to environmental research or improving the environment. And you know, we've, we've got to start being serious about uh, joining up all parts of the uh, value chain in relation to addressing this 
uh, environmental challenge that we face. And as airlines, we're doing it. You know, we're, we're collectively, we're, we're investing billions every year in new technology aircraft, which are significantly more efficient than the aircraft that they are replacing. But yet, we're not being able to fully exploit those aircraft with the technology that exists because we have a, a fragmented air traffic control system in Europe. So there's a lot that can be done uh, and the idea that uh, you know, taxing the industry is going to make it better is a nonsense. It's not. It's just going to reduce the amount of money that this industry uh, can and is investing in new technology to try and improve uh, the environmental performance of our business. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time for today. Thank you to our CEOs Good. and uh, to all of you uh, watching wasn't that at painful, home. Was it? With okay. this, we'll uh, see you in a couple minutes. <laughs>